How many people here that are running operations facilities have ever picked up a geographical map and looked at your area and said, where are the common transportation routes that one disaster might knock out? Yeah. A lot of people have it. There was the f a fire in the Baltimore Tunnel a couple of years ago. It took out huge amounts of capacity because especially as you get more into suburban areas, there may just be one physical path and the only way you're going to be able to, to work around it is possibly satellite. Now, whether that's something you want to promise your users, whether you have an insurer that will support that, I don't know. But these are things to look at. Now let's talk about voice over IP specifically. What breaks? Well, the first thing that will break, you know, usually is on the customer premises. And that can be any number of things. Uh, you know, how are they, they have, you know, is it an analog phone that plugs into a set-top box? Is it that they've got an IP phone? Um, most often, before I eventually threw away our uh, IP phone in there is a uh, guy I was working with refused to put a TFTP server in the local machine. So every time there was an, a momentary power outage, I lost the default route and the, uh, the IP telephone couldn't get its code any longer. Uh, depending on what you're putting on site or in the neighborhood, uh, say if you've got fiber to a neighborhood and you've got a pedestal in it, it's not a bad idea to consider if you've got the pedestal to put maybe a DHCP and TFTP server in there uh, because, you know, you lose neighborhood power, everything is down, and if they can't get beyond your point, you know, they're host. Uh, PBXs are another problem. One of the things I have found is that if you are going to any fair-sized enterprise, it's unusual that you can throw out all of their voice equipment. Chances are, for example, they've got a, uh, maybe a voice messaging system that they like and they don't want to throw it away. Uh, if you are dealing with anything in the air safety or aviation industry, they have their own unique air ink defined four wire analog uh, circuit or adapter that nothing else in the world supports. So basically what you need to start thinking about is you go to them and say, what do you have here? What are things that won't be supported? And then start thinking about how do you give them a T1 equivalent out of your premises router? And that usually will be adequate, is, is tell them that's a T1 and they can live with that. But uh, if you try to make some things like a large Meridian, uh, say, uh, message switch or a conferencing bridge they've spent a lot of money on, you know, they're just not willing to do that. The next thing that happens is how do you firewall voice over IP? And that depends. There are two ways of peering voice over IP. One is that you just do ordinary BGP peering and you let the voice sessions keep up with each other. If, however, you want stateful failover that you might normally do in a NAT or a firewall, that won't happen. You tend to need a session border controller function, which is basically a stateful firewall. It can have more security in it, but that's basically what it does. Um, and it, it understands SIP and essentially can act as a SIP proxy. There turn out to be a lot of reasons when you have a soft switch in there that uh, are other common elements that you contract out for. Now, traditionally, your regular telco uh, facilities had the SS7 network and they got their directory assistance over that. They got their local number portability, their 800 lookup, their 911, all came in there. The chances are, whether you're an enterprise with a call manager and, you know, don't need local number portability, but you need something, or if you're bringing in a soft switch, you don't have SS7 connectivity most of the time to that. Instead, what you need is a third-party SIP vendor tends to be the way you do it. So even if you have no customers that have their own voice over IP, you still may need to have one or two session border gateways in your operations center so you can continue having the necessary operations support thing, billing. You know, again, people often outtake their, their soft switch and they run their billing to a third-party provider. 
Local number portability, 800 lookup, all these things. There are now service bureaus that do these probably cheaper than you can do yourself if you're a, a large, not a very large facility. But again, think about the failover mechanisms. Now, how does your upstream talk to you? And I'm talking about now in a telco sense. Uh, one system I dealt with recently was kind of interesting is uh, they are a company that actually owns a very large amount of the fiber in the Southwest. And they have a couple of small telcos that they provide on it, but they've got thousands of miles of now OC192 fiber, and they sell bandwidth. And uh, I said, okay, well, how do you communicate? You're, they are not going to go, though, with anything like local SIP, local voice over IP. They bring it to channel banks, and only then, then they put it onto a sonnet ring, and then they, just as a stub, and feed that to the OC192 network. The way they actually connect upstream is they have a central office switch that does nothing but talk to their inter-exchange carriers. In that, and at that point, you can talk to that switch, expects GR303, uh, which is the ex core specification for TDM to your environment. So when the people start bringing that up, it's probably a typical Sonnet or ATM interface. But again, what they often have to talk to their upstreams is regular telco equipment. It may be a small switch, but it's a telco switch, and it doesn't know about IP. It doesn't know how to spell it. So what, again, you wind up doing is you may give it some DS1s or DS3s, and it understands that, and the soft switch can produce it out of its media gateway. One of the critical things that goes on, okay, well, that is light blue on light blue, uh, is that if you look at the architecture of most soft switches today, they are split into two basic functions. There is the call agent that does the call agent pro actual call processing, find the trunk, so on. And then you have a bunch of media gateways. And the media gateways, depending, may be actually have phones that plug into them. It may be T1s. The whole idea of a media gateway is it's programmable, and it's got different interface cards. You can have regular TDM plugging into that. You could have Ethernets going into them, so on. But that's you're essentially your your next, for want of a better term. And they have to go to someplace intelligent to find out how to route a call. And that's the call agent part. What happens is that anyone remember going back to when we had nice, fast, 9600 nice BPS lines and you were bridging and you had root wars, that the root in two different places because of timing reasons would decide, hi, I'm the root of the spanning tree. And the other would say, no, I'm the root. And they'd sit there fighting each other. That's exactly what happens now in soft switches, is that they typically have redundant call agent boards in a single enclosure. But what, in general, if you try to, you say, okay, I've got two main central offices, so I'll put one call agent board in each one. This is often not a good idea, unless, for example, the, the last time we did this and everyone involved was comfortable that it would work is we had two mile apart OC192 facilities between the two locations. And they had actually had failover strands on them. One of the big mysteries not given out of, of soft switches is if they have multiple call agents and the call agents get out of sync, you have the whole system thrashing for control. Uh, the way several vendors do it is they run essentially VRP between them. And this gets interesting as well, because typically if you have two different sites and two different in town, you'd probably route between them. But routing doesn't work if it's going to be the same subnet. So you often have to have layer one or layer two connectivity between your central offices. Otherwise, you know, if they're, they've got built into the soft switch VRP to figure out which call agent is active. Or even if you have read and call uh, agent boards in two separate machines, you'll typically have one set of VRP in each room and then one that goes between the data centers. And one of the hardest things that turns out in these cases is to get below layer three connectivity. Because you know, your TDM isn't the way to do it. 
you often need to run facilities or you may wind up saying, no, I will accept the risk of losing one facility and one call agent because the probability of the voice over IP network going completely crazy because it's got unsynchronized call agents is probably higher than losing one of your central offices. So think long and hard of how your central offices are interconnected and unless you have absolutely bulletproof lines between them, essentially set them up as master-slave, put dual call agents in the soft switch in one of them, but don't try to spread them across the two, lot, uh, two facilities unless you control the physical facilities in between. It's just not something you can trust to let out. Video is another problem. Uh, first, how does the video come into your facility? Satellite feed? Maybe. A lot of places that'll be the case. Could it come down to you digitized? Yeah. But remember that if you've got HDTV or so on, you've got multi-bit gigabit rates coming down. If there's fiber coming into you, fine. But if not, one of the things you have to do is go out there and start saying, okay, am I getting this on a satellite? What can break with the satellite? Do I know if, it, if there's a wind and it gets out of alignment? Can I put it back? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, depends on the size. Uh, one of the specific problems ran into Iraq was that it now is allowed, at least in all the bases I know, there's only one contractor that's allowed to put in VSAT dishes. Because it gets windy enough out there, and with the sandstorm with it being abrasive, then unless you know exactly how to tie down that satellite dish, it turns into a lethal frisbee. Uh, apparently this is actually often, you know, the thing is, you're not worrying about people shooting mortars and rockets, you're wanting, because the thing is, they don't have enough range to get to you. The satellite dishes do. And I've, I've seen pictures, one was uh, Humvee had about a one meter dish sunk about a foot into its side. And I could picture out in the Great Plains and so on, you're getting winds like that. So if you've got a small dish, be very sure you have someone that knows how to install it, that it's fail safe, or you know, that it's, you know, the equivalent, you've got it on a chain. Because a high wind, or tornado certainly, uh, you know, can launch the things, and since they're somewhat aerodynamic, they start floating. And when they hit, they hit hard. Uh, you will also, obviously, to feed, you got your streams coming in, but to distribute your customers, you need multicast. I don't understand why this is, but I have found with small telcos that want to start uh, dealing with video, you start saying, okay, here's your head end, and you multicast onto it, and they say, what's multicast? Then the other thing is that I've noticed is you get it to the last router before the distribution network or a switch that's feeding into that. Now, typically, they've had someone go in, and let's say it's a, it's a diverse area, so they've set up PIM or whatever the multicast routing is. The way, usually, anyone that's clueful enough to set that up is fine. Where the problem comes in is they don't know how to set up IGMP, and they don't know how to set up a multicast static route in their last hop router. So if you get called in, these tend to be the first places to look. Uh, last three, four times, that there was supposed to be a video turn up and we get called and nothing worked. We telemed it into the router and you said, excuse me, here's, here's the head end. This is where your uh, multicast is coming in. These are your interfaces. There's nothing in between them. The router doesn't know how to get there. It's not that it's direct connected as, uh, you know, yeah, if these were unicast and you just plugged it in, everything would work because it's direct connect. Multicast isn't that way because you have to be on the group thing has to get IGMP and pass the IGMP upstream to wherever the multicast routing takes place. And it's just not a telco-ish concept. So if you deal with a telco that's trying to do a video, one of the first things you want to sit down and be sure they understand the ramifications for multicast. Just the same way as if you're dealing with an ISP that's starting out voice over IP, they don't understand typically the reliability requirement for voice. Another question is, 
If you have video on demand, is that something that's an upstream provider? So you have to have some sort of upstream communications path so they can know, okay, you've just joined this multicast group, or do you have to have servers on site? Well, if you have servers on site, remember, if you've got a few hundred channels you might want to listen to, and a couple of hours, but that is a big disk. So you have to consider those things and be aware on that. And the same way is you will have people trying to steal servers. It doesn't matter if they put in more equipment that costs them more than subscribing. It's not as much fun. Now, one of the questions is, how do you know about a disaster? Well, if it's a security flap, if you're on NSPSEC, you will get early warning. But actually, we're around here. You know, this is the whole idea of your peering contacts, so on. If you start seeing multiple places going down, it may be worth some phone calls and saying, you know, what's going on. And I don't care what your boss thinks of having a TV set or two in the knock. Have one always on CNN and on the Weather Channel. And be sure that you, when you put them in, even though it might not be good, even though you normally feed them with cable, guess what? Put an outside antenna on them. Emergency services may call you. Now, one of the things that you can have happening is it may be that any, ranging anywhere from a you know, threatened dam to a fire that's getting out of control, one of the things may very well be, especially if you've got a reasonably hard knock, is a good idea to talk to your fire and EMS people ahead of time to see if you can be of mutual assistance to each other. Uh, there was a situation during Katrina where they had to make one very hard decision. I think it was the right one. Apparently, there was one really big uh, inner toll uh, telephone switch office in downtown New Orleans. And Somewhere else was a chilled water facility supplying it, and as the waters came up, they lost their chilled water. And they made a conscious decision to pull a fire engine off an active working fire to go over to feed water to those things. Because if, you know, if you lose all our upstream, and they also did this for one of the ISPs, that you know, if you're chilled water, you can lose it. And chilled water is getting more and more popular, so it may be something where ahead of time, having a long talk with the fire department and say, you may be dependent on communications coming through this facility. Maybe you want to dispatch them, or maybe you just have a booster pump that you could give us, the kind you know they use if they're drawing water from a river, in a couple of intermediate hops, they often have things that go on the back of a pickup. And that may be enough for your purposes. Another thing that, well, I guess I knew one day when I was, I don't know if I, you know, and there's always the distinction, are you a nerd or a geek or which, but whatever it was, I was a fairly high-ranking one in a development organization. And I just, I had a nice window office. You know how I found out there was a snowstorm going outside and the jobs couldn't see through? Somebody sent me an email. Uh, it really is a good idea to look outside occasionally. Um, now, that's obviously for weather conditions, but fires are another thing. Now, one of the things we learned out of 9-11, and this is actually something that's, I don't, I don't think I've seen on the Nanog mailing list, but it's come out to be a problem that most people don't think of. Now, in New York, what happened is the you know, high reliability providers had a week's worth of diesel for their generators in South Manhattan, and you know they had made arrangements with police and fire. Even if it was blockaded, they would get shipments in before they were out of fuel. But within 24 to 48 hours, their generators started quitting. Anyone know why? Dust. Dust. And it turns out this is not as obscure. It's not just the twin towers. Because then I was we're in some conversation. Said, "Gee, that happened to us in the Northwest." when we had Mount St. Helens. And then I talked to a friend who's in uh, an interior area in British Columbia, and they have, they're completely ringed by forests, and a bad forest fire can do this to you. The air filter may cost $15, but no one was sparing them. And even if you have 
a local fire, but say in a chemical warehouse or something, which is putting out a lot of soot, that could be enough to jam your generator. So it's some of the cheapest 15 to 25 dollars you can spend is keep a couple extra air filters. And also remember if things quit, that may be the reason. Another thing, depending on your location, is that generators are safe enough, nobody's going to pick them up and steal them generally. That is not true, however, of the starter battery, which someone can take off with a couple of bolt cutters and get money for their next ra uh, rock of crack. It is always a good idea to keep at least one spare starter battery inside in a locked room trickle charged. And of course put a fence around the generator. It may or may not help you, but there's some interesting things with it. Now fuel turns out, and let me come, let me come back to fuel because it's gone. When you want to talk to your providers and your customers, Look at all the ways of communication you have. Guaranteed at least two of them will go out. So it may be that you, know, you might be overloaded on, on cellular telephone, and I have a way out of that, which we'll get to. But it may be the short message service works when you can't get dial tone for a call. Pagers may work. Uh, we also dealt with this a lot in hospitals. Um, there is, I, I am on the trauma and critical care mailing list of the uh, Society of Trauma Fellows, and there were some major issues like Houston tried to get itself tremendously ready for Rita, but they still wound up with situations where the ambulances couldn't talk to the hospital and so on. There were variously, they had no common frequency, or it, some of the things they needed, like the, the power company, all they had was the ability to phone them. There was nothing else. No one had ever thought of having it, even though the power company itself has its own radio network. Put it, you know, the idea is if you're in a hospital, if you're in a knock, if you're in a power company, talk to your other critical infrastructure people and say, do you have your, do you have your own private radio, for example? They often do. They said, good, can I get on your network for emergency use? And they said, gee, yeah. We're the power company. We might have a, pa a pole tip over on someone. Yeah, we'd like to be able to get directly through to the emergency room. So, you know, it's just people haven't thought about this. Now, here's one of your problems, again, with telephone, is everybody says 800 numbers. What happens if you lose the 800 database? No, or if someone's trying to call you, you know, there was this is an ITFB, you remember, but there was a few years back, somebody in Israel uh, not, did an AS7007. They redistributed Sprint Europe out to everybody else in the Middle East, at least to talk to them. And what I heard, the way that got solved was a little informal situation, is the community was small enough that the guy that was up watching his, his knock melt down went out, looked up the, the owner of the other ISP, which had no night coverage, and uh, he was hauled off by the police, the potential terrorist, because he was, he was standing at the guy's apartment door, pounding on it, and said, I'm going to teach you how not to redistribute PGP. But it did solve the problem. Uh, look, satellite phones can be useful. Now, there's an interesting, landlines obviously go down. Cellular may go down, cellular may not, and, or you may be in a special category. How many people here are on GETS? WPS? How many have heard of them? Ah. www.ncs.gov, National Communication System. Now, it used did anyone, does everyone, everyone remember ever calling someone on area code 710? I'll bet you haven't, because 710 is the unlisted area code. That is what you, what happens is, I forget what the acronym stands for, GETS is the priority on, on landline. Uh, it used to be that you dialed 710 and you got a prefix code, and that bypass is all load control in the telephone network. Uh, WPS is wireless priority system which is again, it is something where it signals the switches, you have to get these government approved. It's not that hard, it's just that, you know, basically, 
Communications providers are considered national critical infrastructure. So if you want to get a GETS line for your NOC, you're not going to get a lot of grief about that. I know all the people on the Cisco NSP SWAT teams have, in fact, the wireless phones. Uh, I can think of what I just asked her about it is uh, she had NSP SEC, her own cell phone, the WSPS cell phone, a pager. I looked in her purse and it was like looking into fries. Uh, you know, I wonder, do you, know, do you have money in there anywhere? Or it just seems to be all communications equipment. Uh, anyway, Getz is a, sir, will you fill out some applications and you talk to them? This, you, it's, I was involved with the National Communication System when it was under the Defense Department. And what it has to charter is for emergency communications restoration. The original goal was in the event of nuclear war, how do you start to reconstitute critical services? Um, it's now in Homeland Security, which meant at least during Katrina and Reno, while they tried to do things, the FCC, being independent of Homeland Security, wound up doing the emergency priority management because the NCS people weren't allowed into the operations center. You know, it was a problem. But anyway, with GETS now, what it is, there is apparent, I understand there, there are actually both 800 and non 800 numbers. You get a, a card that has a, an access code on. I don't know if it's a smart card or not, but essentially what you do is that then you get put into area code 710, wherever you are, and no matter what load control is present, if it's Mother's Day or whatever, you will not get a reorder fast busy tone. You will get through. Uh, and you know, hospitals can get this too. Again, the emergency operations center in Houston didn't know it existed. And that was for the whole county, and that as Ben Taub General Hospital, which is one of the tribal trauma centers. Wireless party system is new. It used to be for just one uh, wireless provider, and now they've got a couple on it. If you get the phone also, it will be a secure wireless phone. Uh, the way that they do it is, it, it, one, it has regular priority attention that apparently the cell protocols know about is don't block this call if other stuff is coming through. But apparently what happens is that if you have a major outage like New Orleans, you might have lost your local two or three cell towers. The WPS phones were still getting through because they had the priority signal, so the other cells started listening for them. I don't know if they can go up with power or not, but I know they have been working on this problem. It, may, it looks like a regular phone, but it's actually a government crypto with an unclassified uh, encryption unit in it, although it's the same size as any other uh, cell phone. They're still experimenting with this, but these can get issued. And I don't know how long the issuance time is. Uh, gets, I don't think, takes long at all to get onto once you satisfy someone you're a significant communications provider. And in particular, if any of your local emergency services, hospitals, would ever go through you, even for internet access, that's a legitimate requirement. Uh, there is a, uh, a system called um, DMS services or DMIS services, um, Disaster Management Interoperability Service, which for some reason no one has ever explained to me is the URL for it is www.cmis. You know, for some reason it, it's CMIS work. They couldn't get a D. I don't know why. But what this is, is it's an open system. Essentially, it's government-free code that anybody can get, runs under Windows, extensible, object-oriented, that runs essentially the uh, instant command system, which is the standardized procedure of all fire and emergency from local to national to deal with a major event. Uh, and the systems have gotten very interesting on this. They have now, they were giving them satellites, and they still are. Because what you can do on now the uh, DMIS systems, uh, they did it, for example, on the dirty bomb test at Boeing Field at Seattle. There was a, a trial of it. To give you an idea what this thing can do, and again, if your local people haven't heard of DMIS, you may want to go talk to your emergency operations system. Because what will happen is they started out and said, okay, here are a couple of laptops, and they're projecting that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they put up the area of supposedly the, the immediate contamination with a street map and said, this is where the radiation source. And said, okay. And then they put all the fire trucks onto it. The fire 
chief said, hey, that's not, not too bad. And they said, okay, what are you going to do next, guys? And said, what do you mean? He said, you've got a radioactive cloud. What are you going to do with it? And then they started hitting some more keys. And literally, they've been given this requirement, give you an idea of the extensibility of the software, two weeks before the event. The next thing they did is they pulled in the EPA's toxic cloud dispersion model and uh, got a live National Weather Service report, and they predicted where the cloud was going to go. And, and then he said, oh, well, yeah, but how do we decide where to evacuate? And he said, gotcha. They then did, and this is across the internet, went to the census. And they said, what time of day do you want us to assume? And they said, well, let's say it's night. I said, good. And it highlighted all the apartment houses, hotels, and hospitals in the area that would be high density housing. They said, daytime, here are your high density office buildings. These are where you need to go to. And then they slapped a satellite photo on top of it and said, this is where the plume will get blocked by a hill so you've got time to get there or that is a collection point. They went beyond that then and said, they have essentially the equivalent of eBay on there, except for emergency services. It started out and said, you know, I'm a fire department, I need more air tanks or a compressor. They now have a system on it where we'll go out on the internet, essentially people, much like on eBay, bid is say, hey, I've got an extra compressor truck and a hundred Scott air packs. You need them? And the, you, you then look and say, who's closest to you? And get it. So these are some of the things is now, if your local fire department doesn't know that exists and you're willing to get them connected to that, do you think you're going to have a problem maybe getting an emergency generator or water pump from them? One hand washes the other in this stuff. But again, I very rarely um, I'm trying to think if it was a Cisco or a Nano presentation. Uh, for those of you in Cisco uh, or, you know, the, the one, uh, one contact for GETS and WPS is Wendy Garvin. Or I think if you just call up the, the NCS people, they'll start you on the process. You know, it's just mostly it's not a big deal because no one's ever heard of them. This goes back to what your service level agreement is. Now, when you go triple play, what you need to start thinking about is that, is this, well, I mean, let's put it this way. Someone picks up, it, you know, you got an old dial-up customer. How many times dial-up customer wonder, am I going to get connected to AOL or whatever? But someone goes to the phone. Well, I mean, your average user is going to say, there better be dial tone in that phone. They pick it up, there's dial tone, right? And I, you know, I was checking with one class of mine. I said, is there dial tone in the phone when you haven't picked it up? And he said, I don't know. I said, well, is the light on in your refrigerator when the door is closed? And someone so said, I know. He said, good, how do you know? He said, well, the light bulb burned out last year. I never replaced it. But the reality is dial tone is saying, hi, I'm the phone network. I recognize you. And that is not exactly the level of expectation people have had when they've been ISPs, that it's always going to be there. And this gets to be a coastal thing. That's about 140 years ago when Alexander Graham Bell decided he wanted to order for delivery pizza and had, realized he had to invent the telephone first. But in 140 years, the telcos may not have learned a lot of stuff. What they've learned a lot about is emergency restoration. Sometimes they don't get it right. One of the, my all-time favorites was a blacked out of a region. They had uh, about 50,000 user outage in New York. Is, it was hot, summer and extremely hot. And Con Ed, the power utility, asked anybody that's got their own generators, could you shed load and go onto your own supply? And they said, okay. Uh, you know, they also had 48 hours worth of battery behind that. So they figured, we'll be okay. Now, at some point or another, though, it was still going on. It was getting to the end of the 48 hours. They were start, the battery, one of the generators had died. The batteries were starting to go low, and they had loud alarm bells that went off when this happened. All they needed to do is throw, throw the transfer switch and get back on utility power. However, there was no one there to hear the bell. And why was that? Because this was in the old bell system, and everyone in operations was attending a, manual, a mandatory seminar on high availability. So, yeah, I mean, this is one of the things, again, try to talk to the telco people. And again, there's a lot more awareness of this. Not all a terrorist situation uh, want 
I started as a biochemist, and some of the things that I see with, with chemical plants and transit scare me, you know, much more than things like this. Uh, give you a case in point, if you've got a railroad line anywhere near you, in World War I, when the Germans first attacked with chemical weapons, they used 160 tons of chlorine on an 8,000 meter front that killed almost everybody on it. Now, there are tank cars of chlorine, it's water purification. It's around everywhere. The standard two tank car sizes that go around on railroads carrying chlorine are 90 and 55 tons. What if one derails, or even better, what if the terrorist puts an anti-tank round into one of them? You've got a mile that may be lethal without protective gear. So that's one thing to consider that, you know, again, it may even be, in some cases, if you know you're near a chemical plant, you may want to have hazmat gear in the knock, because you may need it just to get out. Masks for most, I mean, you know, for industrial chemicals aren't that bad. And then again, there are unforeseen consequences. Uh, a lot of water systems are converting uh, to use uh, chloramines, which are not nearly as toxic as chlorine. Um, and that's a nice idea, it works, it tastes a little better, and so on. But one thing that nobody thought about, chloramines happen to be excellent rust inhibitors. And I was either Tucson or Phoenix, I forget. The first few cities it went into had the ceramic water pipes. And this city had cast iron, which was held together by the rust. And as soon as they cut over water purification, all the streets were exploding. <laughs> So when you start saying something for a voice, what's your service level agreement for voice? Well, at least when I worked for Nortel and we were doing carrier switches, the rule was once up, always up. And that is the telco attitude. So if an ISP is starting to offer phone services, you know, it's not just that you can't reach 911 because maybe you don't have E911 service in there. It's that you can't phone anywhere. There's a liability issue there. Um, I never want to be in a house, for example, that only has, unless it's multi-home, voice over IP. I at least want a cell phone. Because, you know, it's like someone said about Morse code, or even better, that the Army saying about a handgun is you only need a pistol when you need one very, very, very much. So, again, mission critical data. Well, whose mission is that, you know, some online shopping facility? Or is that the emergency communications for the regional emergency dispatch? You may have, I mean, you know, you may want to find out when you get onto GETS or WPS, find out who else around is on it. Yours might be out. But the thing is, you need in your locality to build up a people network of the emergency services and do it ahead of time. The FBI will help out in this to some extent in that they have now been asked to be consultants on to brief ISPs ahead of time. If you have a major uh, attack of some sort on your facilities, you know, to let, so since not all offices have people that know about communications, they will let you know where is the nearest office. I mean, let's face it, with some FBI also said, wait a minute, where's my typewriter? What, what's this thing with this TV set in front of me? Uh, but um, they're one thing, but talk to your local police, fire, so you may dig around, find your communications people, and come up with, in fire service, this is called mutual aid. And it's something that for some reason, ISPs will call each other and help each other, but they don't necessarily recognize that the regular emergency services may be able to provide that kind of help. And again, if you're going into the triple play business, nobody really cares if the gaming system goes, they're going to, gripe about it, but if it's something like in Huntsville, for example, uh, we have the Huntsville Hospital System on there. They use the cable system there for their medical education and medical dispatch. Uh, I, I am told that the way that uh, it works out that, that every so often, just to be sure the civilians don't watch it, uh, you know, like every half hour, you know, they, they show someone doing hemorrhoid surgery or something and scares everyone away and except the ones they're supposed to watch. Now this again, what is being expected? How much reliability? Now, one of the interesting things, this is the blast door to Cheyenne Mountain. 
and they have finally decided they're going to close, or they'll keep it inactive. There'll be a small staff in there. For quite a while, well, basically, since the Soviets had the SS-18 missile, uh, Cheyenne Mountain was no longer invulnerable, but they did a cost benefit said, you know, inside this mountain, it's cold in here, and they demonstrated how much they saved on air conditioning power, but they finally decided that, that now that they've got the, the, what was formerly the Space Command is now the Northern Command and has domestic responsibility. They want to have more office space and so on. So now they, they've moved it to the outside area at Peterson Air Force Base. But they have a different way of looking at things. For example, their idea of backup power. This, if I'm you see it goes way off into the haze in the distance. Those are still generators going fast for 60 day supply. Now, is this something that expect, well, how long does someone expect you to stay up? And just like has happened, apparently people were proactive in Manhattan with the telcos there and the ISPs is the fire and police department said, do you have a generator? We know about that. One, because of fire hazard. And two, do you need how much diesel do you have, and might you need to have a police escorted refill after a week or something? So those plans were all in place. How many of you are in a situation where you have diesel, is if you, you know, 48 hours a week? If there's a major disaster, is there some way that a convoy can get into you? There are a number of factors that come into power. Uh, one is, obviously, if you can, come off more than one substation. Uh, there was one, uh, now as I understand, my favorite power story was, I believe it's the computer science building at Stanford. And a lot of places use it as a pop. And it comes, it's on, on, on diesels, and it has two substation feeds. It was about as good as you can get. But then about three in the morning once, there was suddenly this great big bang, flash, lights went out, and people went running out to the smoke. And there was the little fragments of, see, like burnt meat coming down. Well, it turned out there was a big mechanical power transfer switch among the three of them. And a pair of rats set up housekeeping inside and started doing rats thing when they want lots of little rats. And shall we say there was a dead short. And it took out about three feet of buzz bar. Not wire, rigid copper. You know how you're going to get that fixed? at 3 o'clock in the morning. And Sun started complaining because it turned out, well, they said, we're disconnected from the internet. Well, it turned out Sun was single home to that site on the theory. Well, they've got so much backup, they'll never be down. Anyway, diesel fuel has got a shelf life. There's several factors, most of which is it tends to collect water in the bottom. So you need to keep turning it over. It's also from my I'm not a mechanical person, but, but people told me about generator motors. That you really should run them about once a week for 10 minutes. Be sure the bearings are all fine and the starting battery's okay. And you'll use up some fuel, and you just simply want more fuel deliveries every so often. Uh, so you might as well use it up because it, I think at best it'll last two to three years. Now, we're talking to batteries and air filters and fencing. Here's an interesting question. And again, this is something that happened to Katrina and at least one place actually had thought about this. Uh, one of the hospitals had its generators on a mid-level of its parking garage. What they had done, though, is they put, for various reasons and good reasons, they put the fuel tanks on the ground level. Well, the water was up between the second and third uh, story of there, and they still had power to keep up. So it was, you know, it's not a question of refilling those tanks is what happens if you keep sucking on a fuel tank and there's nothing coming in as far as air? You have a vent. And here they actually were smart enough to do what they do on commercial ocean-going oil tankers. They ran through a cooler and they vented the exhaust of the generator back into the fuel tanks, which now puts a blank of inert gas on top of it. And also, if you do that, is if you're you know, in Minneapolis or something, you may need to have diesel tank heaters. But if you recirculate the exhaust gas into it, not only does it keep a vacuum from forming, not only does it protect you against fire, it also helps keep the diesel warm. 
Now, I'm sure there are probably cold climates where you need to chill the diesel, but those are the ones that run into them. So rising water is one thing, is believe it or not, if they're built for it properly and they're vented either, either to the air or to the exhaust line, your fuel tanks will continue to work underwater. Uh, there are issues about, though, how high you want them to be or what is under them. Uh, I keep getting different stories about what happened to World Trade Center 9, or 70, was, that you know, I've heard different levels of how high they were, they were, the main diesel tanks were at ground level, but they had supplementary tanks at least up to the ninth floor. Now, the emergency operations center was above that, but I think right now there's a lot of research going on about how high is it safe to put even a backup tank. Also, you have problems like this with your uninterrupted power systems if they have a liquid electrolyte. Now, this is not followed too often, but the uh, National uh, Fire Protection Code, I believe, says you do not put liquid electrolyte batteries above the third story. Otherwise, you get too much danger of acid electrolyte pouring down on the rescue force. So here you may have some things. Hey, you may need, if you really want it to keep going, you may want to think of something other than a liquid electrolyte. Uh, and then as the case with the rats, you need to figure out, is there any common point? I mean, people don't usually think that a switch with a, you know, a lever that you threw like that would break, but it did. Okay, now availability, as I mentioned, is something that is a relative thing. And you have to remember the real experts on rules. It's always a good idea to have a Ferengi in sales. You've got a difference between business services and commercial and uh, residential and so on. What's the period availability? Is, is, a, is it quoted maybe a business? Do they ever work late? Do you have maintenance windows? How about for voice over IP or TV? Not just the amount of volume is, uh, it's got to be up all the time. And when it comes, can you have a way of providing resources? I mean, is there a situation where if it, your uplinks are partially destroyed? Let's say you're getting a video feed from someone. Is it possible if that's physically diversely routed on different fiber? In an emergency situation, might you preempt that and get that hooked up to a telephone feed at the other end? It's been done. Uh, also, another thing to consider, uh, used to live in Arlington, Virginia, and remember that cable tr TV franchises are normally on a city or a county basis, but very often it may be one company or just sometimes because of zoning and where you put the large satellite dishes, all the head ends are near each other. So even though it's not called for, if you get together with cable providers, they'll often interconnect. They're not allowed by tariff to send TV over it, but for internet, that's usually not tariff. Or for voice, they can get that connectivity, and they may even have satellite uplinks. No matter what you do, though, there are going to be failures in the local loop of cable or so on. And, it, you know, it gets sometimes when you call for help. I think the thing that's most annoyed me about outages on cable is when they've got you on hold for two, you know, 30 minutes or so, which is more frustrating, saying your call is very important to us, or two, they're saying, if you go to our self-help site on the web, I, I go back and forth, I'm usually ready to kill. Uh, what I have found is, I used to be on Comcast, and I found that their second level center is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So you, if you get someone really clueless at first level, ask for escalation and then sound Canadian or say something about hockey or something, and suddenly they can't do enough for you. Uh, but one of the things you may want to, even for home offices, this is something I'm very actively considering doing, is that can I get, can you ask, let's say you're a cable provider, and that's why you're providing broadband. Even though that you're a competitor, can you strike a deal with a local telco saying that will you give us a bulk discount if we multi-home sites on your DSL. Some nice deals have been cut. 
and it's kind of win-win for everybody. I mean, yeah, cable's going to be faster, but the thing is, they are physically diverse media, other than, you know, yeah, maybe coming out of the building, but once you get out into the street, they're going to be quite diverse, you hope. Uh, Excuse me? Uh, that is that, uh, again, maybe not a giant phone company, but if you're going and let's say you are providing cable broadband, you go to your local business office of your uh, telco that's providing DSL and say, if we guarantee to buy so much bandwidth as backup from you, will you give us a cut rate on that? And they say, wait a second, these are sites we've already lost to you. So sure, that gives us back a good deal. Or, but the thing is that if you find the, pe the right mercenary enough people, if you're a cable carrier, you may get very good telephone service rates and vice versa. And the, the way to sell it to them is convincing them that they otherwise would have lost any revenue out of it. These are the typical now getting into the... Uh, various kinds of, of threats is, you know, if you're doing hosting, what happens? You know, uh, you have single failure, server failures. I'll show you some things we did with an interesting hosting center not long. But you have to make some of the decisions. If you cluster servers at one site, is it hot standby, warm, stateful standby, or cold standby? And before you say throw out cold standby, uh, one of the sites I work with uh, deliberately has a, they have two dual processor Cisco 7500s at each site. One is cold. The reason they have the they dual RSPs and everything in one of them, so they figure that's safe enough for failover. But the extra one is so they can do microcode or iOS upgrades on it and they won't do that. And that's some, or is sometimes what you might want to do is even get an older, cheaper unit and keep it there. A lot of telco central offices are triple processor for that reason. One is active, one is hot standby, one is the one you do maintenance upgrades. When you do the maintenance upgrades, you then swap that, that with a hot standby. So you're never down. And we usually think in terms of two devices, but there's a lot to be said about three. I like my backhoe animation. Uh, Again, we've gone over a lot of these things, but again, is there a single medium failure? Uh, are there things you can't do anything about? Yes. And you may, if there are times you need business insurance. There was one, uh, was then Boeing Computer Services, but the, let's see, uh, May East had moved at that point. But somebody was trenching in this great new auger that was going to lay new fiber for something and drilled into their duct. And not only, though, it blew fiber into it, crashing into what was there, and then it pumped concrete behind it. Now, I think a lot of us tend to forget about sub-IP technologies and how they can be useful. There is still a role for layer two. One of our clients is, their, is my old firm clients, has got two data centers. And as I mentioned, they're, they're uh, in the Midwest. They're about 20 miles apart. They have plenty of dark fiber between the two. One of the things that they, they are basically, they're specialized hosting service. It's some office application that I don't really understand, but they said, hey, it's not a problem. You, you know, essentially, single transaction, failover, no problem. So we can have totally, du we have duplicate IP servers. So what they did, or what we did for them, is we set up the two sites and they had 7500s coming in with two different ISPs, and we then ran that over to the other side over the dark fiber. But then what we did is we put a layer of 30, uh, 3750s in between, running spanning tree between the two sites, and we put duplicate IP addresses on the servers at each site. Well, as long as one was up and the root was over on that side, it went to those IP addresses. But as soon as they lost layer two connectivity, they would automatically fail over to the other ones with the same IP addresses. We all say DNS on any cast. So it turned out that with a way that would have been really hard to handle with routing, with you know. Now, I will say that on all of these servers, we had dual NICs. We had the one that was to the customer, but then they did have unique internal addresses for maintenance. But that worked out real well. 
Um, even if you are, have IP and you're doing service provision, consider private VLANs for security. And again, if you do something like that call agent case, you are like, if you have to run VRP, HSRP, GLBP between sites, you are either going to need physical connectivity or layer two connectivity, or I, I've had to do this with some tunneled bridging through layer three, and it was truly ugly. You can do it. You know, you, you can do a GRE tunnel, between, but convince it's all one subnet, but you really don't want to do that. Again, you typically, is in these situations, for Metaswitch, for example, you have seven VRP addresses that have to be tracked. Each pair of call agents has unique pair of unique addresses and a, a virtual address, and then the second group has a second one, and then there's a sort of a super VRP they wrote on their own, which set, selects between the two clusters. So you actually percolate your way up through seven addresses that can be actually on four servers. But that's what you really need to do to get a reliable soft switch. Now, IP works, but again, don't think in the box. Any cast is very nice for DNS, uh, for other services uh, like sinkholes. Uh, your, how do you handle your virtual IP address? Again, I mentioned you have to think about how do I handle virtual IP addresses, whether they're failover for routers or they're failover for servers. Now, if you're going to voice over IP, your biggest problem, some of you are pretty cluful in this, mo at some point or another, you're going to have to connect to the rest of the telephone world. Now, if you have one, what's actually a good way to do it is someone offers you a SIP proxy, the chances they, they know that SIP exists and they can offer that, and they can make, and, and, you know, it's your two tests. So the guy comes to you and says, I'll offer you a SIP proxy and it's over Metro Ethernet. If they knew to form that sentence, they probably know what they're doing. However, in um, one case we dealt with was, uh, they said, oh, how do we do that? Well, uh, we have a Nortel DMS 200 that connects to the interchange providers. You connect to that. And he said, well, yeah, but how do we connect to it? It's just got T1s. And he said, yeah. And T T3s too. So what we did is we wound up with a situation where you had analog phones, went into a local loop, that then went into a T1 channel bank, and or a couple of them, and then it went to an OC192 mesh, came off the OC192 mesh at gig E or at T1 again, and fed back into the up upstream switch. Now why were we putting in you know, DWDM OC192 in order to run T1s over it. I never did figure that out. And they said, well, it's going to be for the wireless. And I said, what wireless? I said, oh, the wireless we're going to get into, that business. Okay. Anyway, some ways out of this problem. If someone is looking and your, your upstream is saying, we want GR303. They say, okay, how do you want it? And they said, well, ATM would be good, or Sonnet which is what's in the GR303 spec. And you say, you look at your equipment, you've just thrown out maybe some older routers that had signed interfaces, and you've now got nice Metro Ethernet, Gig Ethernet, 10 gig, you've got nothing to do with that. Well, this is where the private wire emulation service comes in, which is an MPLS extension, and essentially it can make, Cisco has got it kind of in a proprietary implementation, uh, Juniper and a couple others now have both scanned. This also been, it's been called Dry Martini or Gibson. But these are various ways where through an MPLS network, you can come off it looking like a T1, Sonnet, ATM, so on. And I, it's, it's a rem I forgot the exact, Cisco may have it now, uh, but it really doesn't matter. You don't have to interoperate with anyone because if you go to Cisco and a Cisco, and you know, you've got MPLS inside, this is what gives you your upstream ATM interface, and you had previously thrown away your ATM switch. So PWE3 is it stands for private wire emulation end to edge to edge. Well to me that should be PWE E T E, or I don't know how they get the three in there, but that's the way it works. 
But if you really want to connect and use full services and have an intelligent telephony network, you need SIP. Not because, if, for example, you can actually peer. In, there are you could set up now plausible peering points for SIP in a metropolitan area, and you are essentially a layer five peering point, and it, it turns out to wind up getting your economics for delivering telephone service, especially locally, if you start peering, or even if you've got people that are out of your immediate area, but they, hey, you say to them, hey, you know, we're IP peered now, we got plenty of bandwidth, do you have SIP? And they said, yeah, we have SIP, do you have SIP? I said, fine, let's peer. And suddenly you're four states away and you get essentially a tall quality voice network with fairly little problem. The soft switch doesn't care. Again, how are you going to distribute your pay-per-view? That's one of the things that tends not to be thought of. You, it may be that the cable provider does it for you, but much of the time that's a satellite feed and they expect you to store it somewhere. How eventually, though, one of the things, if you have a cable out there now that's coax, that's going to have to go fiber. Remember, we've got the mandate this year of the FCC to start going digital on new TV and you've got to get HDTV going. That won't work over coax. It just doesn't have the bandwidth. So one of the questions is, sooner or later you're going to start tearing out the coax, because there's no use for it anymore. What do you put in to replace it? Fiber to the curb, to the, uh, you know, the, to the household, to the building. There's a whole business here, fiber to the building. If you go into, say, office buildings and hotels, you come in there at 10 gig and said, hi, anybody want 100 meg? You know, utility connection, no big deal. And this is going to be either you, my team, do it, if you're the cable carrier, do it, or you say, talk, talk to your cable carrier and get ready to, to do it. We'll cooperate on this. I want to run through just quickly a couple things to bear in mind. Now, you didn't answer my question about used car salesmen. What's the most important machine in the hospital? Is there no one any longer that listens to Monty Python? The machine that goes ping, yes. The one that tells you the, the baby is alive. Uh, I see we need remedial Monty Python here. But the significant thing is that's a very real question to ask yourself every time. How do I ping? Now, how many of these things will let pings go through them? Even if the router interfaces, if you're trying to ping one, are going to return ICMP echo reply. Uh, it is a very frequent thing if you're doing dynamic assignment, if you're doing DHCP and you're a broadband provider and somebody calls up, what's his current IP address? How do you know? Another thing to look for that I've run into several cases recently is look very closely, may I talk to the vendor, about your high-end routers. It may be that can you update the backup blades? It may turn out that there's an internal bus. It's said to be one back plane, but there are really multiple back planes, and you will be intrusive if you pull the processor. Or there may be something where for your interface cards, if you want to be physically redundant, you need them in different rows on the same machine. Uh, again, talk to your vendor and find out. For when they talk about single point of failure, they usually mean processor or memory, but it may be that there are active components in the back plane that can die. And usually if you can figure around them, fine, you have to know where they are. The worst case I ever ran into, though, was with uh, Cisco 7000, where you had nice power supplies that you, you know, power supply failure, the redundant one took over, fine, we shipped it, got a new one to ship it, and then the horrible truth came. This thing was sitting in a rack with a raised floor, so we have the power supplies are down here. All the signal cables are coming straight at the back, going to stream relief bar, and then dropping down under the floor. We started to pull out the power supply to replace it and discovered with the cables behind it, there wasn't enough room to pull out the power supply. Find out before running cables if every card, no matter how your cables run in the rack, if the cards can come out. You do, the way we solved that was we were eventually able to get some five-year-old son to come in and crawl inside the rack. And we directed him to how to pull it out. So again, all these things, how do you ping? 
Uh, this is some backup stuff here that I've got going on, uh, really things we've, I think, been through on multi-homing. I'd like to really try to throw this over questions and also is what are the weirdest things you've had happen to you operationally because they will happen to someone else sooner or later. My offering comes, it was happened to be at SAS Institute, which is one of the best organized, but more than data center, you know, the whole big software operation. At the time they had fitting around everything else and they had a local phone network. One of the things that CS had done is they built this huge video production building to do their training tapes. And after a while, they learned that this was uh, the largest, at the time, video production facility in Carolina. So this started running out of time. And people would come in and do ads on it. Well, one they just got a car company, said, we want to do our new car ads for it. And they said, sure, sign you up for a day in this, this facility. What happened with them on that day is what they had not told, they said, we're going to bring in these cars. Said, yeah, we got a way to get it in there. We've got these cast members. Yeah, no problem. What they did not tell them was that one of the cast was a live tiger. Well, somewhere in the taping, the tiger decided he was getting bored and he wanted to take a nap. And as a cat, he wanted a nice, warm place to take a nap. And some decided that the video control board would be a great place to do that. So he went in, and luckily the operator wasn't in there at the time, and no one was going to go in, and he stretched out on the control panel. Let everything stopped for 10 or 15 minutes, and then the tiger woke up again. And he decided it was a nice place. And he did, being a cat, the way little boy cats mark places they, they have liked and want to come back to. They now had a very wet control panel. I'm told it took them three months to deodorize the studio. Okay, what's your equivalent? Okay, fair enough. I'll call it formally the end of it at this point. You know, I have some multi-homing scenarios, but you know, there already was a separate seminar on that, so I'm not going to go into it. What I'm really trying to leave you with is get outside the box on emergency services. Think about alternate voice communication. There are a lot of options available to you. Think about your local hospital, fire, police, all that, will work with you. They may not know they're going to work with you, but you can make a good case for it. DMI services, I'll, I'll put this on the nano list also, uh, are some places that you may want to contact and get some of these services, and there may be a business opportunity. But certainly, these are ways to keep things up. Thank you.